Welcome to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. I'm your host, Maria Marlowe, and this is a place where we don't rely on good luck or good genes for our health and happiness, but rather we create it with our thoughts and our actions each and every single day. Each week, I'll bring you a thought or a guest that will help you live your happiest and healthiest life. Are you ready? Welcome back to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. Today, we're talking about one of my favorite topics, which is love and relationships with an international dating and relationship coach, Sammy Wonder. Now, Sammy's philosophy on love, relationships, and marriage is pretty unique. I was first introduced to her and her philosophy via a friend who sent me an article all about her philosophy. And she really specializes in three things. First is attracting your ideal mate, then building a strong relationship with that person, and then finally making sure that that relationship lasts over the long run. Over the years, she's also become known as the Get the Ring Coach because she's at least partly responsible for 106 engagements over the past two years. Now, I just want to make it clear that while I do think that strong relationships are a key component of health and happiness, I don't think marriage necessarily is. It could be if that's what you want, but it doesn't have to be if you don't. I will say regardless of whether you're for or against marriage, one thing that is for certain is that strong relationships do contribute to our health and happiness. So it has been shown time and time again that people who have strong relationships are happier, they're healthier, and they live longer. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a romantic relationship, it's just relationships in general. And another thing I want to point out is that her being called the Get the Ring Coach can put the focus on one thing, which is getting married. And I don't think that marriage is a destination. I think it is the start of really building a strong bond and relationship with someone, which hopefully you've already set the foundation for, but then really building that lifelong partnership with another person. So let's meet Sammy. Sammy, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So let's start from the beginning. How did you end up a dating coach? Well, long story short, I ended up as a dating coach because I was struggling a lot myself with men. And men were just these mysterious, unpredictable creatures to me. And I couldn't figure out why a reasonably good looking, smart, intelligent, hardworking woman would have such a hard time with men and having a stable, loving relationship that goes all the way to forever commitment. So that's what got me interested in the world of relationships and dating. But of course, we have to be in deep pain in order to want deep transformation in our lives. So I would say my defining moment was when this man that I thought was the one for me dumped me overnight. (laughs) and told me he wasn't feeling it for me and couldn't give me what I wanted, which was long-term commitment. And then I realized that something had to change in the way I was doing love and relationships. So he was not the first man to do that. And until then, I had not looked at my patterns and relationships. And I had thought, oh, you know, I was a lot into man bashing and blaming men and telling they're all douchebags and you know they get intimidated by my success and they don't like a woman with brains and I was doing all of that stuff and of course man after man was fizzling out or you know it would be really hot and then it would be cold again and or if you had a boyfriend then the boyfriend wouldn't go to the ring and so there was definitely those patterns there but I think I wasn't at a point seriously and to address them but when that guy that I thought was my one brought up that pain for me I realized it was time to look at what was going wrong and then again long story short um, I confidently say today I figured it out I figured out where I was going wrong and within nine months I met attracted and married (laughs) My wonderful husband, Chris, he's six feet, two inches tall, handsome, sensitive German man. And I'm a mother today, happily married, and 
you know, also running my heart centered company where I teach other powerful, high achieving women how to create the same results that I created in my own life. So that's pretty incredible. And nine months is a pretty short time to attract, you know, fall in love with and get married. So what was that switch for you? Like, what was that turning point? Like, what did you realize you were doing wrong? And how did you turn it all around? I think one of the biggest keys for me was understanding the power of masculine and feminine dynamics in a romantic relationship. So understanding that how we give and deal with friendships and colleagues and work relationships is not the way we deal with men. So what I was doing was that because I was smart and successful, you know, I was, I was really forward going and I had a lot of masculine energy and I even brought that, which was great. I mean, it was great for my career, but it also, I brought that to my love life and I brought that to men. And when you bring masculine energy with men into your relationships and into your romantic interactions, you don't pull in a masculine man, you repel a masculine man. Right. And I see that a lot, especially in New York. I mean, even in myself, like I think it's very easy to get stuck in the masculine if you're climbing up the corporate ladder or you're starting your own business or just really being an independent woman. In a way, being an independent woman, we really do have to be in our masculine sometimes. So how easy is this switch or being able to balance the masculine versus feminine? Like how long does that usually take someone to be able to easily and seamlessly make the, that switch? Well, I would say, you know, I think we first have to look at the genesis of the issue, right? So we are women, the, the current, the young, I, I work with a lot of women from the age groups of 30, 46, you know, the ones who, who have, most of them have their careers in order, they're making good money, they have their house and they drive their car and they have friends and they do yoga and take care of their bodies. And, you know, all of that stuff is going on very well. It's just the love aspect that is somehow still missing or it's a puzzle or it's not figured out. And then one of the first things I do with these women is to figure out where in their lives did they first learn to be so much in their masculine energy. So we are products of a generation where when we were growing up as little girls, we were taught, you gotta go get, you can have everything you want, you go get it, whatever you want, you go get it, go fight for it. And we were also somehow brought up, not just in a feminist environment, but also in a high, in an environment that was very still, very patriarchal, that, that still gave a lot of importance to masculine values. So we gave importance to you know, winning, we gave importance to achievements, we gave importance to what, how much money you make and how far you get in life and what job you get. And all of our identity came from that. Nobody told us that, you know, you are valuable just because you are. You don't have to get more money and you don't have to get more, more success in order to feel worthy, right? So that's a feminine, feminine masculine thing because masculine will gain sense of validation externally by what he achieves, by his drive, by his ambition. And feminine will gain validation from within, which is I am worthy just because I am. Or, you know, more masculine values of, you know, don't show your emotions. Emotions are weak and you've got to be put together and you've got to show the world like how you've got everything together. So as little girls, when we cried, we were not told it's okay to feel what you feel, but we were immediately told to suppress it, move on, put up a show, get your act together, girl. So that's what most of us have learned to do. That's what I was doing my into, in my 20s. I was doing. So I did not have any access to my vulnerability. I did not have any access to my sense of worthiness from the inside. And so I just approached men and love everything externally. I just tried really hard to impress and tried really hard to show what a great catch I am. And that is where in the patriarchy, in the upbringing, in the beliefs is where the genesis of the problem lies, where only masculine ways of looking, winning, succeeding is what we are giving importance to versus 
feminine ways of being and feminine ways of you are worthy and feminine ways of you are, you can just relax and receive and you are worthy of receiving even if you have you are not working hard and trying hard, right? So it's in the it's in the genesis. The genesis is there. So as you can imagine, turning off, turning around our beliefs from childhood that we have carried for years and years is not an easy job to do. It's not an easy job, right? But if you have the determination, and if if someone shows you the way and says, "Okay, so far you thought this was valuable, but what if I told you?" You are valuable just the way you are and you don't have to be at a date and try so hard and, you know, try to impress him and win him and tell him how many languages you speak and how amazing you are, right? So it is not easy for my clients, but I think if you are determined and if you really are ready to work on yourself and attract your soulmate and bring in that man, I think everything is possible. You can, you can really turn it around. For sure. Yeah. But you have to want it and be mindful of it because I think you're right. I think these ideas and things are really ingrained in our society and they're ingrained in us from when we're little girls. And so, yeah, I could imagine it takes a little time to get used to thinking I am valuable just because I am. Yeah. And there's a lot of awareness that goes into turning around your day-to-day behaviors. Because right now, so far, we've just spoken of broader theoretical concepts around masculine, feminine. But what does that look like in daily life? What does a feminine woman look like in daily life? What does she look like in her interactions with men? So that is where I teach those behaviors to my clients. And then they have to go out into the world and be mindful and aware of actually implementing those behaviors tangibly in their lives in order to get the results they desire. Right. Okay. So in your, in your coaching, you're basically helping women become or act more feminine, stay more in their feminine energy, in their daily life, in their thinking. And, and then that is what is going to help attract the mate that is going to have the serious relationship that they want. Absolutely. And we have 106 engagements now. So I can tell you, I can tell you this works. In fact, not just that feminine energy, high value behaviors work, but that men are thirsting for it. They are thirsting to experience femininity because we're living in a society where women have so sadly suppressed their innate power. It's not something that I teach you that you have to change about yourself or that you have to bring in from the outside. It already lies within you. You were born this way and then you were conditioned to suppress it. You were conditioned to tone it down. You were conditioned to not be that way. So we are living in a society where there's so much social media and everyone is connected to everybody, but actually we're really thirsty for deeper connection. And femininity is that magical key to that deeper connection between a man and a woman. So it works. (laughs) Yes. We have to get to the fact that you're called the get the ring coach and you have 106 engagements under your belt. But just to clarify, so when you're talking about femininity and being in your feminine, you're not talking about just wearing a dress and putting lipstick on. You're talking about the actions as well. It's in your energy. It's in your energy. So I think it's a bonus if you throw on a dress. I think it's a bonus if you put on a nice lipstick. But have you ever seen that woman who's got that lipstick on point and dress on point and shoes on point, and yet she doesn't inspire a deeper connection? She feels guarded or you are afraid of approaching her. Her energy, there's something there in the energy that is not inspiring you to get closer and get to know her. And before we, you know, (laughs) assess this woman more, which is what a lot of my clients feel like, you know, they're, they're probably not even recognizing that they're guarded. They're probably not even recognizing that they're not being inviting to men. I think we have to also like be kind and compassionate again to this woman because she has learned that way of being. It's not her natural way of being. It's her, it's her learned way of being. Right. So that is what we have to unlearn. But primarily it's your energy. It's 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 what someone is feeling around you, not just what you dress and how you talk. 
Right. And it's so true. I mean, even just regardless of in dating, you know, when you're at an event or networking or things like that, there are certain people that just have attractive qualities, whether man or man or woman. And there are others that you don't feel necessarily compelled to talk to or want to talk to. And it is interesting because it is all in the energy and are they open and inviting or are they a little bit closed off? So I think it's just a matter of teaching yourself and practicing to be a little bit more open and inviting versus hands crossed in the corner and um, not, not so inviting. Absolutely. So let's talk about the, the fact that you are the get the ring coach and you have a very interesting way of getting, getting to the ring. And I think it's very different than what most other dating or relationship coaches or people will tell you. So can you explain your, what your philosophy is on getting or getting into a serious relationship that results in a marriage? So I don't believe in girlfriend, boyfriend. There, I said it. (laughs) (laughs) This, This is like huge news. Okay. What do you believe in? I believe in marriage. Now, having said that, if someone's happy with girlfriend, boyfriend, and if someone wants girlfriend, boyfriend, that's fine with me. No judgment, right? It's about what we want. And I'm not serving necessarily that woman who just wants girlfriend. If she wants that, that's fine. This philosophy is not, this philosophy is not for her not to judge her. I help when a client comes to me and she's single and she says, I don't want the ring, but I just want the boyfriend. I'm like, fine, then we'll get you the boyfriend. So it's not, it's not about me imposing the ring on every woman. But the philosophy that we are talking about on getting the ring is is as follows, and it's meant for that woman who wants marriage. Girlfriend and boyfriend is what we do when we are 21, 19, 14. If you are 33 and you're still doing girlfriend, boyfriend, and you want marriage, and you want marriage, if you're fine and happy, that's fine with me. But if you want marriage, then you're not, you're not doing it right. <laughs> because What I teach women is that when you want forever commitment, that's when you put your cards honestly on the table and you let a man know that I'm not willing to be any man's girlfriend. So it's not manipulative towards him. I'm not willing to be any man's girlfriend, no matter how amazing he is, because what I want is forever commitment. And I'm not willing to settle for anything less than that. And until you know what you want with me and you have a solid offer and a solid plan, I would like to keep my options open. Why on earth will I lock myself down with a man who is still test driving me? If he really knows I am the one for him, then he's just won the jackpot because I told him if he has a solid offer, I'm going to be all his. So if he really wants me, if he really wants me, and this is, this is the part where it gets tricky, right? Girlfriend is an easy status to give. A man doesn't lose much there. But it's when the ring and the marriage and the forever commitment come on the table, that's when he really has to think hard. That's what makes a man think really hard. So my philosophy is for women who are, you know, I work with CEOs and I work with like really high, high achieving, powerful women. And sometimes their success in their career is completely disproportionate to what their love lives are feeling like. Yeah, it's, it's where they're losing their power completely. And so I call this women empowerment in love. Women don't settle for a commitment less than they desire. So if you desire more and if you want marriage, then why are you there? Why should you be there? Why you should be there with someone who is still making up his mind about you. You want to be with a man who has made up his mind about you and who knows without an iota of doubt that you are the one for him forever and ever and ever. I know I was quoted on the BBC and the Sun and Daily Mail saying she makes you date other men till you have the ring, but that's not true. It's not about, so I call it rotational dating and I and, I, and I'm, it's not about rotational sleeping, it's rotational dating. I'm all about connection with men from a deep, intimate space, which doesn't necessarily have to go into the physical realm. 
you know, you can date and you can meet men for coffee dates and dates in the park, but you can keep your energy and vibe open till the man in your life knows without an iota of doubt that you are the one he wants. And he has the choice to walk away as well. This is not manipulation. If you are not the one, then that's clarity and that's gift for you so that you at 35, 36, 37, don't stay there six years, seven years, four years, five years, hoping one day he will make his mind up about you and choose you. Disempowered place to be for women. So this is not sensational. This is not, you know, just something that makes headlines where this is real empowerment for women in love who want marriage. If you don't want marriage, that's fine. So this is a very revolutionary way of looking at things, I think, compared to what we're used to. And so when you first started this, doing this, uh, starting the rotational dating and starting to say, put your foot down and say like, no, if you you just want to take me out for a test drive, um, I'm not up for that. If you know that you're serious, then, then you can, you know, we can take this further. So when you first started saying that to men, how did they respond to it? Shocked, shocked, surprised, silence, disbelief, (laughs) but very powerful and very attractive for the right men. So when I was rotational dating, so I was dating three, four men and at the same time, and I wasn't sleeping with anyone. And then of course, as intimacy grows and you get to know someone more and more, the same men start to block out your time more. So like at the end of it, like, two months or three months down the line, Chris and another guy were the only two people left, like, because it was frequent and the connection was building. And then I remember Chris took me for this uh, lunch and there he said, so where is this going? I call this the relationship talk. And I teach women how not to bring this up. Beep, beep. But he brought it up and I had to give a nice smile to myself. He said, so where is this going? What are we? Who are we? This is feeling good. Would you like to be my girlfriend? And I said, well, we are seeing each other and I don't believe in girlfriend. I believe in forever commitment. So until you know what you want for us in the future, if there is a future, no pressure, I would like to keep my options open and I would like love to see you, but I would also be seeing others. Disbelief, complete silence on the date. He didn't say anything after that. He walked me home. He went away. Two days, I did not hear from him at all. And then the third day, I got a message again, an invite for a date again. And that was the day when he actually asked me, so what is your imagination of a future? Do you want kids? Do you, it got serious. It got serious. And till today, he tells me that I was the first woman in his life that actually made him think because girlfriend is what he's always had. He's had three of them before me. So what would be be the next one, right? And then it could also pass. Then we kept dating. We kept seeing each other. And then in nine months, he had proposed. So we, he proposed in nine months. We got married six months later. He proposed in nine months. And then all the options were out. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. That's pretty incredible. Because I imagine it would weed people out pretty quickly. The ones that are really not serious and are just looking to have fun, they would you know, uh, sort of taper off very, very quickly. Whereas the ones who are more serious, those are the ones that are going to stick with you through that process. Absolutely. And don't forget like nine months sound early, nine months sounds fast, but my earliest client, fastest client engagement is three months, four months. I, and these are like the the three month lady, she's, she's in the, she's a cardiologist in the U S 44 years old, did my system from A to Z to the T, right? Has an amazing man in her life. I think a lot of the times we have all these beliefs in our head. You really have to get to know someone and you really have to see if you're compatible. Well, good news is that you don't. You don't. You either trust or you don't. You feel your intuition. If it's feeling good, if it's feeling safe and you're ready and he's ready, it's, it's almost always good. But the bad news is that there is no guarantee. 
even you can be married and you can, you know, test drive people for seven years and on the eighth year they cheat you and they go out. Like there is no guarantee. That amount of risk is in every relationship, including mine. Let's, we are human beings, right? So while that, that amount of risk is always there, and I teach women that masculine men, when they know they want you, they come and get you. There is not so much analysis and overthinking. You know, it's not how men operate. Men are very instinctive when it comes to attraction, and they know it in their gut much faster and much more clearly than we women can sometimes right? Because we mix up our head with it, but they know whether they are coming for you or not. And if you are a woman who can produce that gut level attraction in a man, which is what I teach, you know, I also teach get the ring is not just statistics of single women going to the ring. Get the ring statistics are also statistics of women in relationships getting to the ring. So there are a lot of my clients who are with boyfriends who are wanting marriage the ladies are wanting marriage but it's somehow not moving to that stage so that is there as well because you can create that kind of gut attraction in a man at any time really it's all about your skills and those are the skills i teach right so it's interesting that you say that because i have just amongst male friends who are married i have on many occasions heard them like i remember i was at one wedding and the man was talking about how when he first saw his now wife, he just knew immediately that that was going to be the mother of his children. Uh, and so things like that, where they just have that gut feeling and that gut inclination that this is the person that they want to be with. Um, that being said, so I first learned about you. A friend of mine had sent me the article. You were in, um, I think it was the Daily Mail. You were quoted talking about your philosophy and talking about this whole philosophy of rotational dating. And I was like, wow, this is great. And so I do have a boyfriend. So I sent it to him and I was like, hey, what do you think about this? He's like, don't even think about it. I'm like, why? You know, I mean, it's been two years, you know, you need to, you need to make a decision at this point. So, so I don't think if you're in a relationship, right, for a period of time, I would imagine it's a bit harder to all of a sudden start rotational dating. So what do you say to those women who are in a relationship? Like, how is it different for them? Yeah. So of course, in a committed relationship, if the agreement is exclusivity and commitment, we can't suddenly start going out and dating. That would be wrong, morally wrong. So here, you know, I think there's a there's really a multi-pronged approach that I take to this. I don't think it's a simple answer because I will work with the woman in the relationship, her behaviors in the relationship, right? So I will check where she's still in masculine. I will put her into the feminine. I will check where she has the nice girl syndrome. I will put her into diva. I will check in waiting energy or holding energy. Vibe is closed. I'm exclusive. No, open your vibe. You're still a girlfriend. You're not a wife. Yeah. So there, it's a multi-pronged approach, but I will change the behaviors of that woman in the relationship and it works really fast. It works really fast. The men just wake up to your value. So a lot of the times, you know, they've been taking you a bit for granted. Like she's there and she's lovely. Like, and it's a winning team. She's happy. I'm happy. Why do I need to change anything? Right? So that's where we shake up and wake up and do things differently within the relationship in order to inspire the man. And they step up really, really fast. That's why those numbers. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. I've read some of the testimonials on your site and they're, they're pretty impressive. <laughs> so what you do is you're really teaching women how to change their energy, how to change their perspective and become just this magnetic and attractive person. But where are they attracting the men from? So if you're single, what are some ways or ideas you have for people to meet or attract a good possible future husband? Okay, so I do believe that you have to be present on online dating. Now, again, not have to like, you should do it, you should do it, you must do it. I think it's wise to do it simply because a lot of my clients have met their husbands and partners online. And there's a lot of trash there as well. I agree. But where isn't? There's also a lot of trash in real life, <laughs> right? So there's good people and bad people everywhere in real life and online and offline. So you also want to not write like a work kind of a profile, but more feminine feeling, vibrational energy profile. Yeah, that's going to pull in the good men. So definitely online dating. And then, you know, organically meeting men, parks, bars, theaters, museums, there are good men everywhere. 
I think what we're looking at is the ability to spot them. So a lot of the times, a lot of the times, my high-end clients, they constantly ask me, where are the good men, Sammy? Where are the good men? Where are the good men? And it's because for them, the definition of the good man is any man who is six feet tall, really handsome, really charming, really successful. And it's like this model fantasy in the head that most good men out there will not be fulfilling. And we are so tight and so checklisted in our vision of the good men that we're not able to spot the real good ones out there. So looking for a model. There are going to be very few of those. And the model and the model features are absolutely no guarantee for features and qualities that you actually need for a man, in a man, to build up a long-term partnership with, right? So traits like loyalty, traits like honesty, traits like masculine energy, providing, caring for your happiness, caring for your feelings, making you a priority, all of that stuff that actually defines a quality man is something you can never filter through if you're just filtering through your checklist of this much height, this so, such looks, so and so skin color, right? So good men are everywhere. And what women, I teach my clients to hone is the ability to recognize that goodness, even if it comes differently packaged, right? So just go out into the world and start noticing which are the men who open doors for you? Which are the men who say, you first, madam? Which are the men who, you know, when you're in a flustered state, come and ask you anything wrong? Can I, can I help? Those are the good men. And those are the men we're not noticing. So it's not about, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. They're, the world is full of them. And I'm a abundance, not scarcity. So it's whatever we want is there in abundance for us. It's about honing in and tuning in our ability to recognize it in the moment and invite it in. I love that you said that. So I'm a huge proponent of writing a list of what you want, whether it's in your career, your personal life, your relationships. And when it comes to writing your ideal partner list, I love that you really underscored the importance of thinking about the qualities that you're looking for in a partner versus solely the physical traits. And you could have both on there, but it's really the qualities of their character that are more important than the physical traits. Absolutely. And a lot of the clients that I work with, they have, they are never attracted to men who like them. And they're always attracted to men who don't, who don't give them a damn. So this is like, a, this is like a deeper issue that you have to work through because it is deeply connected with your sense of worthiness. So a lot of the times women tell me the men who don't give me attention are the attractive ones. The ones who give me attention, I just take them for granted. They're boring. So this is where we really have to work on you know making a woman choose more healthily choose more healthily and it has a lot to do with again how we look at attraction how we have issues with receiving if we don't think we're sexy enough and a man finds us sexy we get irritated with him right so and we look at that man who doesn't find us sexy so that we can convince him that we are sexy right so this is this proving constantly proving chasing proving chasing that goes on so choosing more healthy. Yeah, you know, I, and it is funny, right? Uh, very oftentimes, as you get into your 30s and you look back at your relationships, they're usually different versions of the same exact thing. You know, you always tend to choose the same type of person and the same sort of issues will crop up. So I'd imagine you're really helping people pinpoint and say, okay, this is what you're doing. You're totally choosing the bad boy. You've had so many great guys, but you've decided not to go with them because maybe you don't feel worthy or maybe you're not ready for the commitment or whatever the case may be. I mean, a lot of the times we also come up with issues from childhood when we unpack those things, those patterns. So if you were neglected as a little girl by your mother or your father, or you had a difficult relationship with your parents at home, then that has become your idea of love. You chase love, you chase affection, you chase what you can't have. And so when you grow up, you still do that. So you choose your daddy in another form. Yeah, because your, your relationship with love is that's how it feels. Of course, it breaks your heart. Of course, you have to work hard. Of course, you have to run after it. Of course, you have to prove yourself. Of course, of course, right? So if we've not had healthy role models, which I also did not have, I mean, I love my parents to bits. God bless them. They're amazing parents to me, but between themselves, 
it wasn't very nice. It wasn't very loving. And so even I grew up with that role model, like screwed up role model of what love looks like, giving, 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 never being able to receive. That's what mommy was doing with daddy, right? And daddy just wanted to give back, but mommy didn't know how to risk. So a part of me was so scared of recreating that stuff in my life that that was actually another inspiration why I started so young and early with this work, right? A lot of women take a lot of time before coming to me. They're like, I'll figure it out on my own. I'll try it on my own. Why do I need a coach? But I started doing this work professionally so quickly and so early because I was so scared of recreating that thing that I had seen in my childhood. So I think a lot of the times the toxic patterns that we learn or our subconscious, they're actually coming from really deeply ingrained childhood experiences. Yeah, it's so interesting. I think that in many areas of our life, not just love, we have habits or thought patterns, perspectives that we think just are or they're just the way we are, but they're actually triggered by some event or something that happened right when we were a kid. And unless you really do the work to dig deeper with any issues that maybe you have, you may not realize that it's stemming from some unfounded childhood belief or event. So switching gears, I want to hear your perspective on soulmates. Do you think that there's one person for all of us? Well, I it's a question I don't particularly like because I, I, I think the answer would be it depends. While I do believe that we are all here to experience love and connection, it's hard for me to say if there's just one person. What if something happens to that one person? Are you doomed forever? No, like, like I think you're here to experience amazing love and connection with someone who is willing to give that to you and share that with you right? So do I believe in soulmates? Yes. Am I living with mine? Yes. Am I married to mine? Yes. But can I say that this is the only truth and that's it and that's the end of... No, I will always be deserving of love no matter what happens and me, and so will you, right? So if something doesn't work out or you know something happens to your person who you, who you thought was your soulmate, it doesn't mean that love doesn't have a chance to re-enter your life. That's how I look at it. Yeah, I love I love how you said that because I think I was watching a some some video on on YouTube and they were talking about or some interview and they were talking about soulmates and they were saying that there's sort of two types of people. There's a type of people who believe in soulmates and that there's just this one person for you. And then there are the type of people who don't believe in soulmates and or maybe that there you know there are multiple soulmates and these type of people are the ones that actually work on the relationship. Because if you believe there's only one soulmate, then you find this person, you sort of put them on this pedestal, everything's amazing. And then one thing goes wrong and you're like, oh, wait, wait a minute. This person is not my person. This was not my soulmate. After all, I totally made a big mistake and you just kind of walk away. Whereas when you are open to the idea that there is more than one soulmate, then you actually work on the relationship and you actually put a little bit more effort into it because you know that relationships are not just going to be perfect off of the bat, that you do need to put a little bit of work in to really create something that lasts and that works for both of you. Beautiful. And I never put the man on the pedestal anyway, so that wouldn't be an issue with my clients. (laughs) So where do you keep him? I guess right next to you, right? Well, he can always look up to you with awe. (laughs) Oh, so you're on the pedestal. (laughs) You're the goddess. You're the prize. (laughs) So when you are in a relationship, after a period of time, you know, in the beginning, it's fresh, it's exciting. And listen, I totally believe that it could be fresh and exciting forever. But, you know, I think that there is, again, in this, in society, there tends to be this idea or viewpoint that in relationships, as time goes on, they get a little bit more boring. So what tips or advice do you have to keep things fresh and exciting? Okay. So I believe the honeymoon phase can last forever when a woman is in her feminine energy. Yeah, because when she's in her feminine energy, she's always, not always, most of the times, let's be realistic. She's most of the times really present. She's present to the joy in the little things. She can laugh at jokes and she's connected with her sense of humor. She takes care of her body. She looks good. She smells nice. She wears clothes that flatter her because she knows she's desirable. And when you're in that vibration, 
of honoring yourself. And when you're in that vibration of being turned on and tapped in with yourself, I think it's very hard for your men to, for your man to fall out of love with you. It's just it's just not possible. Men are designed to, you know, fall in love with women. We they're designed to, you know, by nature to to like our form and to like like it when we are radiating that sense of joy and worthiness in our relationships, right? So the honeymoon phase can last forever. I am five and a half years married now, so I can tell you, even with a baby and everything, you know, my husband can't get enough of me. And that's not because I, I try hard to please him, um, but because I take care of myself and I feel worthy of his love and his attention. Now, other tips on how to keep the spark alive is to really have time for quality time. So intimacy is really big because we live in a very busy world, busy, busy, busy. There's so much like everybody's really busy and there, then there are kids and there's, uh, you know, your job and your work, which is really demanding for a lot of women. I work with their entrepreneurs. So they also work from home a lot and the partner's also working at home. So all of that stuff can really overtake your life and you have to be extremely mindful of quality time. So I am running a multiple six figures company now and going into seven. And I'm already feeling like how it tends to overtake everything. Like there's always something that is important. There's always something that is urgent and someone always wants your attention. And so I am really prioritizing time in the sun. I'm really prioritizing baby playtime. It's almost on my phone. So put it on your phone, schedule time for husband, schedule time for boyfriend, schedule time for child play, you know, really put those things in your calendar, like you put your meetings and your business projects into your calendar, because that is really important. Your relationships need quality time presence, right? So that's, that's another thing. Another tip on how to keep the spark alive is to really be willing to, to be brave and honest with your partner, with your man. Because over time, things get sepid or they get boring because we lose our honesty. We lose our courage in the relationship. We're like, yeah, he's doing this. Yeah, fine, let him do it. I'm not going to start an argument or I'm not going to say anything about it. Let him do it like because da 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 right? So what really kills relationships in the long run is not that there is a problem, but there's a pile of unresolved problems. And that happens when you are not courageous enough to communicate because you're too afraid to rock the boat. You're too afraid to stand a short-term discomfort. And what you don't understand is that by avoiding that short-term discomfort, you're actually creating long-term issues, right? So I think a couple that is really, that can talk and talk through shit, sorry for the language, is the couple that survives and is the couple that really stays turned on because that again connects deeply with the vulnerability part that I teach women. Of course, I teach you how to talk. So if you're constantly complaining and constantly unhappy, that's going to exhaust your man. Your man can see through what's going on with you. He doesn't constantly have to guess and like you're this, you know, fragile, moody person that he can't put a <laughs> finger on, right? So this kind of a heart communication, heart to heart, lots of heart to heart that kind of communication, brave communication, letting your partner see you if you're struggling, letting your partner help you if you're struggling, right? That kind of keeping your man involved in your life as a woman is very important. So a lot of my clients, you know, they tend to like solve all their problems themselves, you know, like just, and he has no clue that you're struggling or you're having a stressful day or you're feeling overwhelmed or you're feeling really down. And as your partner, he wants to know this. He wants to be there for you. He wants to feel needed as a man as well, right? But our masculine side just wants to get it done with, finish off, don't feel the feeling, do it, cope with it. And then he still feels that energetic flip. Like he feels something is doesn't have the intuition to really put a finger on what it is, also because he's not a mind reader, right? So that kind of courage and willingness to show yourself again and again and again keeps it really hot and keeps it really alive because you know the person that you're connected with you really feel like you're connected with this person yeah and of course I could go on and on I could do an entire program in this but I think the last thing I would say is to to have fun to never forget to play in your relationship to never forget to 
you know, kiss, touch, be like little children and snuggle. And, you know, that's, that, that is so important, you know, speak in your baby voice, let your inner child out, let that stuff flow through you as a woman, you know, again, very deeply connected with vulnerability because some of my strong clients go like, really, can you ever talk to anyone like that? <laughs> yeah. But I love you. I think you're amazing, honey. You're so hot. Like these are such sweet ways that we as women, we already have it. It's just that we've learned that you don't talk like this. You never talk like this. Don't you look stupid. You look silly, but Hey, that's your safe space. That's your relationship for God's sake, right? That's where you get to be fully you and you get to show yourself for play that fun, that, that childlike energy alive in your relationship will also definitely, definitely keep it hot, connected and hot. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I think, you know, communication is definitely key and being open and honest and vulnerable because you're right. I do think that's something that we forget to do or just believe we're not supposed to do, right? That's that social conditioning. So I can see even again, just in regular relationships, non-romantic relationships, the person that you feel like you know better or the person that shares their vulnerability, those are the people that you feel more close to, whether or not, I mean, it's the same thing with social media, right? Where there's bloggers, complete random strangers who are sharing their entire life because they share the ups and the downs and they show you their entire life, you do in some way feel connected to them, even though you don't know them. So I would imagine... Of course, in relationships, it's the same exact thing. If you're so closed off and you're not sharing, it's hard to go deep. But when you are a little bit more open and vulnerable, you can't help but be drawn to that person or in, more interested in that person. I mean, I to be honest with me, I was coming from the place of I don't want to be a burden to him. I don't want to be a burden to him, you know? I don't want to burden him with my stuff. And so there I... I realized, you know, when I studied the work I studied, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm officially trained and I studied the work. I, I saw that men and women are so different in how we look at this situation, you know, where we are struggling and we don't share it because we don't want to be a burden, but actually he wants to help us with our burdens. It makes him feel alive. It makes him feel like a man. It makes him feel needed. It makes him feel like he can make a difference in your life. It's the same feeling you get when you can help someone. So why deprive your man of that feeling? <laughs> right. And I think and another point that you brought up earlier is that sometimes women have a hard time receiving. And I know I have too um, in the past. And I think it's something that I grew up with. My mom, it's like, whenever you ask my mom, you know, do you want this? Do you want that? She's like, no, 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 no. Like, it's always no. The answer is always no. Because again, she doesn't, I think she doesn't want to feel like the burden or you don't want to feel like you're putting anyone out. So I would imagine probably it's ingrained from childhood. That is something. But, you know, why would you say people or women especially have this problem receiving? And then how do we rectify that? I think the problem around receiving again comes from childhood beliefs and conditioning. And I think most of us were brought up to believe that giving is a good thing. And we were brought up to believe that giving is a good thing to the extent that nobody ever even spoke about receiving. So there was no healthy dialogue around receiving. Receiving was assumed to be selfish. It was not the high path. So I know when I was growing up as a child, I was schooled into give, 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 good people give, 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 good people give, love is giving, right? So all those concepts, they play into how we wanna be in a relationship when it comes, you know, when, when it comes to our interactions with men, because if love is a giving and giving is a good thing, then I should be the one giving. And then receiving is, is, is the bad thing. Receiving is not, it's also not just bad. I think it's just not, people are not used to it. People are not used to it. The immediate response women have when someone gives them something is like, no, why you keep, I will do this for you right and then sometimes you can even find like debates going back and forth you know like the friend will bring you something and you're like no you keep it no you keep it I got it for you no 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 I've seen my mom do all of that right I am like hey just someone got your present just say thank you you know just say thank you so I teach my clients you know just say thank you say thank you start there simple thank you someone offers you something say thank you 
someone gives you a compliment, don't say, oh, but I didn't wash my hair. Hey, your dress looks really nice. Oh, but I didn't wash my hair today. Oh, your, your, your shoes are so pretty. Ah, oh, but you know, I think they don't fit that. Just say thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> right? So just say thank you. So just that little switch in the moment. No other response to something being given to you, but thank you. That feels really good. Thank you. Right? So that's, that's like the simplest place to start. And the second place to look at is another limiting belief that might be existing there. What, like, that you have to do something in order to deserve something. So it's like, I didn't work hard for that. I didn't do, like, I didn't do anything to get that. Now, that's another thing that a lot of women, a lot of my clients struggle with when, you know, I teach them to lean back in their femininity and relax and the man will do the work in his masculinity. And then he keeps coming towards them and tells them they're amazing. And they're like, oh my God, like, I didn't do anything. How can this be possible? How, how can he be treating me so well? I didn't do anything. So this is the idea that you're valuable when you do. Whereas I teach the idea you're valuable because you are. And when you start to feel valuable because you are, that's when you're able to receive without doing. And you're able to receive with pleasure because you don't have to do anything to receive. You just have to be. You have to be. And by virtue of being is where you are receiving the gifts of which you are totally worthy. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think it is something, it is something we kind of have to teach ourselves very often is how to be okay and see the value in ourselves just because we are alive, not because we speak this many languages or have this career or make this much money. It's just our, the fact that we are alive. Um, so I love that. And it's so true about the compliments too. That's often, I sometimes I'll be like, oh yeah, no, they're like, you know, this is such a beautiful dress and you're like, oh no, you know, it's so old or so that it's like, yeah, just say thank you. I think that's a really great thing that people can try and even just work on this week and be cognizant of, okay, when someone gives you a compliment, don't swat it off, just say thank you. So that brings us to our last question. And this is something that I like to ask everyone that I have on the show. If you have just one tip or piece of advice for people who want to live a happier life, what would that piece of advice be? Pay deep, deep attention to how you feel. And don't ignore it. And if it's not feeling good, get up, take action, make it better, seek out help, because you only have one life and you deserve to feel happy, good in it. That is a great piece of advice. Thank you so much, Sammy, for being here. If you guys are interested in learning more about Sammy and her programs, you can go to sammywonder.com. That's S-A-M-I-W-U-N-D-E-R.com. I'll also be linking to it on the show notes page, which is mariamarlo.com slash podcast. So I wanted to pop back in with a update because this podcast was recorded in early summer in June. And as some of you may know from Instagram, I recently got engaged in July on July 7th. So I think some of Sammy's tips actually worked. As I mentioned earlier in the podcast, I had sent my partner of two years an, an article about Sammy's philosophy on rotational dating and said, hey, why don't we try this? And he was like, absolutely not, not happening. And of course, I knew that was going to be the response. But what it did was it opened up a conversation, a really honest conversation about our future and what we're doing and where we're going. And I think it just started really getting the wheels turning. Everything that she said about being true to yourself, knowing what you want, and being willing to walk away if someone is not going to offer you what you're looking for. So that way you can find someone who is more on the same wavelength as you and wants what you want. So thank you to Sammy for that. Definitely check out her site, whether you're looking for love or just trying to strengthen your relationship. She has really great advice. Thanks for tuning in this week. If you enjoyed and got value from this episode, I'd be so, so grateful if you can take just one minute to leave an honest review on iTunes, as that will help us reach more people and get incredible guests on the show. To say thank you, email a screenshot of your review to info at mariamarlo.com and we'll send you a free three-day healthy eating sugar detox meal plan. 
After each and every episode, I encourage you to come say hi on Instagram at Maria Marlowe. That's M A R I A M A R L O W E, or in the private Happier and Healthier podcast group on Facebook. In both of these places, we can continue the conversation about today's episode, so come and share what you think. If you want more, you can also head to mariamarlo.com where you'll find tons of healthy recipes, meal plans, and resources to help you live your healthiest and happiest life. Lastly, if there's someone you know who'd enjoy this podcast, make their day, and mine, and send it to them now. Until next time, don't forget, health and happiness are a choice. Our thoughts become our reality, so make sure you're thinking up a masterpiece.